Good morning and welcome. I'm Siobhan Brown, MSP, convener of the COVID-19 Recovery Committee, and I'd like to welcome all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. This morning's panel is titled The COVID-19 Decade, Understanding the Long-Term Societal Impacts and is held in partnership with the David Hume Institute. We're delighted that so many people can join us online today, and we look forward to hearing your comments and questions from you as we get into our discussions. <clears throat> We're here to discuss how the decade ahead will still be defined by COVID-19, as the social, economic and cultural effects of the pandemic continue to ripple effect. This is especially true when it comes to exacerbating pre-pandemic inequalities. So who and how will we rebuild society in new ways that address these health and social inequalities? And will policymakers and local and regional and national governments have the vision or the collaborative spirit to overcome the scale of the challenges ahead? This panel aims to address all these questions in the next 60 minutes or so, so please stay with us. We're delighted that you're able to join us and take part, and I encourage you all to use the event chat function to introduce yourselves, stating your name and your geographical location, and pose any questions you'd like the panel to respond to. I'm very pleased to be joined by our three panelists today. Professor Dominic Abrams, Vice President of Social Science of the British Academy. Talat Yacoub, Consultant for Royal Society, Edinburgh Post-COVID-19 Futures Commission member. And Susan Murray, Director of the David Hume Institute. Welcome everybody this morning. There will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. If you'd like to make a contribution, please enter the question, please enter them into the question and answer box. Make sure you state your first name and where you are this morning, and we'll get through as many questions as possible. However, I would like to begin by asking each of our panelists to summarize very concisely. What is your personal understanding of where the UK is in terms of the social, economic and cultural effect of the pandemic on society? I'll come first to Professor Dominic Abrams, then Talat Yacoub, and then Susan Murray. May I ask Professor Abrahams to outline your thoughts, please. Thank, thank you very much, Siobhan. It's nice to be here. And I should probably explain, um, I'm no longer the Vice President of Social Sciences in the British Academy, but uh, after doing that, I then uh, chaired this review, which is called the COVID Decade, which contains a lot of the information uh, about the thinking about what might happen ahead. Um, and the Academy really identified nine areas of, of long-term impact from, from the pandemic. And these span things like uh, the impacts on the way that communities work, um, impacts on the levels of public trust in different institutions, such as government and the NHS and so on, widening geographic inequalities, exacerbated structural inequalities, worsened health outcomes. This is a long list, isn't it? Nine things that's with halfway through. Uh, importance of mental health growing and changing, um, pressure on revenue streams in the economy, uh, sustainable future really, and the, the role of education and skills in getting us through all this. But I think the important thing to come out of all this is that the effects are going to continue and to reverberate and to develop over time and it is a long-term effect not a short-term one although we all see the short-term ones but the deeper ones will be longer term thanks dominic can i come to Talet? you could please thank you Siobhan. thank you um i agree a lot with what um Fred dominic abrams has just said there from my perspective the 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 biggest impacts that we see now and we will continue to see over the next decade is the exacerbating of inequalities. Before COVID-19 hit, we already knew that black, Asian, minority ethnic communities had um, particular um, difficulties in when it comes to employment, income, access to education um, and experienced inequalities. The same for disabled communities, women, um, LGBT communities, um, rural communities. Where there are inequalities, these were exacerbated by COVID-19. And how we respond needs to have an inequalities lens attached to it. We can't pursue policy the way that we always have. We have an opportunity now, and we must take that opportunity to put people before profit and identify that profit making needs to be for the social good, needs to be for um, a, a, a larger proportion of the UK than it ever has before. 
Otherwise, what we will see are deepening inequalities rather than the tackling of inequalities that many strategies from the Fair Work Convention to the child poverty um, child uh, poverty targets that we have in Scotland will not be met because we are dealing with a second crisis um, that was unexpected, but we were already on the back foot of as a consequence of deep systemic inequality. So what we need to do going forward is not just tackle inequality from the top down, but from the bottom up, which is ensure that communities um, and people are participating as equal co-producers or as partners in the decisions that we make so that they are fit for purpose for their lives. Thank you, Talette. Can we come to Susan Murray, please? <coughs> Hi everyone, um, thank you for inviting me here today and it's a privilege to be part of the Festival of Politics. Um, just to build on what um, the previous two uh, panellists have said, um, it, it has definitely exacerbated inequalities. Those with resources throughout the pandemic have been more able to consolidate those and, and able to spend money to, to meet their needs. Those without have found it much harder and their costs have risen. Um, so we've all seen that, for instance, through the likes of schooling. If you already um, struggling with, for instance, data inequality in your in your household, it was very difficult to homeschool. So, what the David Hume Institute has been doing, we're a small think tank based in Edinburgh, but we've done the largest intergenerational research over the the um, about this time last year. We started um, talking to over 5,000 people across Scotland, and we did that in very different ways because we thought that not everyone would be able to engage in the same way. So, we supported people to um, learn how to use technology with trusted um, advisors because we knew we weren't trusted in communities to go in and say, this is how you use Zoom, this is how you engage. And, and actually what we found is we were able to reach people through technology that would never have come to a roundtable event or a discussion in a community hall because they wouldn't have crossed a threshold. So we had people taking part in discussions that had oxygen cylinders next to them and, and other people that were afraid to leave their home. So we were able to reach and hear voices that would never usually get hired in a policy discussion. And that was a real opportunity. And that's something that I think lots of organizations have learned throughout COVID, and we need to take that forward with us. Um, so what people told us when we spoke to them, and we did survey work to, to test what we were hearing in the standard way using, using omnibus surveys, as well as working with partners like the Children's Parliament, the Youth Parliament, and U3A, which for those that don't know is the University of the Third Age, but it's now just known by its acronym. And people told us, of all ages, there was a clear common message. Um, people wanted to be actively kind. COVID had told us that kindness was really important and they wanted to see more of that. They wanted to take more and faster action to support nature and the environment because we all saw that people that with access to a garden or with access to safe green space close to their house were much more able to handle looking after their well-being throughout the pandemic and throughout the various lockdowns. But the third thing that I think is really important to the economy and post-COVID recovery is people told us they were making more conscious choices with their own money and they wanted governments to be doing the same. And um, so that thought of long-term impact. And I think as we come out of COVID and you know the, the exacerbated effects of Brexit and COVID together, we've got so many labour market changes. We've got so many changes to the economy and things that people have maybe been saying for a long time, but just dismissed as, um, you know, perhaps in, in years gone by, maybe experts weren't listened to or, or some people felt that um, they, they, they didn't necessarily know what they were talking about. People are talking about food security and supply chain issues. They're now front of everyone's mind because that idea of just in time, well, as soon as there's a something in the system that makes the system less resilient, we're all talking about resilience in systems. And if we squeeze systems so hard that there isn't any resilience, just like people, those systems collapse. And that's something we need to think about going forward. Thanks, Susan. If I'll just stay with you, Susan, if I can, just on a more optimistic note, would it be true to say that we've also seen areas of strength and resilience and creativity and innovation emerge during this time? Yes, definitely. I mean, one of the things we've noticed is the rise of micro communities. So you, you've heard for years um, people talking about doing things at community level and you'll hear local governments going in talking to people in communities, but they're often defined by other people. But actually throughout COVID, people defined their own community, whether it was a street or a neighborhood or, or even a block of flats. And, and people came together and quite often using technology like WhatsApp or the old fashioned way of knocking on your neighbor's door and standing back to make sure you weren't transferring germs. But people looked after each other in a way that, that maybe hadn't come through before because we were all rushing around quite so much. 
so one of the good things is that you know the people telling us they wanted more kindness in their lives you know the, the sense that covid gave us to to pause you know it, it was was something that we maybe all need to to think how how do we take that good that came out of the pandemic yes absolutely thanks susan i don't dominic did you want to comment on that i completely agree with everything susan has just said um, but maybe to amplify it as well uh, I mean, we, we did some research um, involving about 9,000 people uh, over eight waves during the pandemic and looked at the role of these things like community involvement, uh, neighborhood activity, and, and all of the rest. And one of the interesting findings from that was that, that there were five areas in England where the government had two years earlier invested in social cohesion. And those five areas, uh, which are places like Blackburn and Walsall, um, actually fared better that the the sort of the social fabric that had been created which was really in partnership between communities and local government mostly um, the fabric that had been created was did indeed provide support and people were more actively engaging they were volunteering more uh, they sustained closer connections with those that they already knew so the, I think there's there's a lot of evidence that um, indeed a lot of, a lot of the strength the fabric of society if you like is on the ground it's not at the top in government. And actually, I think we have learned that um, we've had the ability to mobilize that capacity, then communities and localities and neighborhoods have really done much better. The difficulty that we now face is that actually, it turns out we, we don't have a very good structure for mobilizing that capacity. There is a lack of clear, strong connection between what's happening at national levels and what's happening much more locally. And we need to build a much better um, closer, more effective and dynamic way of working together. And the other thing I think that that's probably quite notable because there are large geographic inequalities both within localities and, and across them is actually um, to get people to have some concern, not just to be kind to one another and their friends, but also to think about the next door neighborhood, the next door area, uh, the rest of the country, if you like. So actually getting better connectedness because one of the things that happened um, following the general election in 2019 and all the Brexit wrangles was that there was huge national division between all kinds of different groups, um, young and old, uh, rich and poor, Remainers, Leavers, you name it. Uh, and, and that did kind of um, close up in the early part of the pandemic in March 20, 2020. But it's all begun to fall away again. And, and that's a worry. Uh, you know, divisions are growing again. And, and the question is why and how's that happening? One of the things that was sustained, though, that didn't change was the sense of unity and trust in local areas. So this is a real strength that we've got that we need to build upon. And that does help, I think, point the way towards policies and strategies for a more sustainable future for all of us. Thanks, Dominic. Very valid points. Talat, did you want to come in? Yes, um, so I certainly agree that um, community cohesion and communities, um, micro communities coming together in the way that Susan described them there, it absolutely happened. But there's a caveat to that. Um, one of the things that uh, was noticed in, um, so I, I was able to do some research uh, with um, almost 400 individuals across Scotland who had participated in some kind of new community engagement on the ground response as a consequence of COVID-19. That might have just been, you know, um, getting the milk for an elderly um, neighbour because they didn't want to have to come and go from the shops you know, with a face mask on, so helping them ensure that they still had access to the community and what they needed, um, dropping off prescriptions for a uh, uh, um, another uh, neighbour or uh, somebody uh, nearby, all these small um, acts of community support and um, togetherness during COVID-19. And that was a, a report written with um, the Cora Foundation, Carnegie Trust and others. Whilst there were many examples of this, many exam positive examples of communities coming together, members of communities reaching out in a way that they usually would not, um, what I, what was noticed was a, a rose-tinted glasses view of, of that at the beginning of COVID-19, where we pushed and encouraged people to support one another and volunteer for their communities, etc. That in itself has inequality within it, because so, first of all, frontline workers who are more likely to be undervalued and underpaid were not part of that space. Um, and second of all, 
a lot of this work was around emergency food parcels and those who were experiencing poverty being given support. Now, I would say that's less about community cohesion and a lot more about communities forced to do that as a consequence of um, state failure. So it's very important that we, we look at this and think, well, it's, it's wonderful that communities came together and we need more of that community cohesion. And, you know, um, Professor Abrams is absolutely right. Where there has been investment in society, in society and in communities locally, they fared better. That's absolutely correct. But that was because of investment from government. We have to look at where communities have felt the need to intervene as a consequence of state failure and poverty and inequality, and where they have been able to add value to support one another without it being interventions to save each other's lives or put food on the table for the week, because that's not the responsibility of your next door neighbour. We've got a question from a member of the online audience, and it's Mustache, and apologies if I've um, mispronounced your name, from Leicester. Is a hybrid model of working a positive step for marginalised communities? If I could start with Professor Dominic Abrams. That's a, that's a very good question. I, I'm not sure um, one can generalise to a whole community. I mean, I think it's definitely an advantage for some individuals and it's an advantage for society as a whole to reduce the amount of, of travelling that people are doing and to sort of reduce the carbon footprint. I think it becomes an advantage for a community if that also releases opportunities for people to do things together other than just work. I mean, working from home is your time is just locked into work. You're not doing anything else. It's really about the use of time and space, not about work. And that's, we begin to rethink that. We have to be addressing our climate change impacts at the same time as everything else, but also to make communities more sustainable. We have to give people in those communities time to do things. We have to recognise that there is actually a value, an economic, but also a social value in the time that people have to work together, to talk to each other, to support each other, to build relationships. Uh, and the kind of mesh that you need to have resilience against dramatic events and challenges is only built up that way. I mean, it doesn't, you can have these emergency sort of, you know, food emergency responses, but actually I think our own research shows that when places had really invested in some of that social infrastructure beforehand, it was much easier to mobilize those kinds of activities. Um, and also the activities aren't then just about providing food or, or just immediate need. They're also, because those people know each other now, they can provide other forms of support, support which, indirectly support mental health services or physical health services, education, all kinds of other things. So I think, you know, we, we have to look at this as a challenge of trying to build a much better mesh or framework in which support comes from multiple directions and that, uh, you know, you mobilise people's capacity to do more than just one thing, not just work, but also all the other things that are valuable in life. Thanks, Dominic. Susan, would you like to come in on this question? Yes, yeah, so I think, um... For me, it, it's a really difficult one because it feels like there's an assumption that a hybrid model of working is accessible to everyone. And I think we need to be clear that it's not because there are some jobs that that have to be done in a certain place. And when you look at the types of people that do the jobs where you have to do those on site, um, quite often those could be in marginalised communities. So you're also making assumptions about the place in which people live. You know, have they got good broadband connectivity or have they got a, a safe space in their house where they're able to work? And as soon as those questions come into mind, you're completely talking about it's it's maybe not a, a straightforward yes or no, it makes things more equitable, because it certainly doesn't. It can make things much more inequitable. So there needs to be choice involved depending on the individual circumstances, I think. Thanks, Susan. Talat? Uh, yeah, just to echo what's already been said, if you are from a marginalised community, for example, um, Black, Asian, minority ethnic communities are more likely to be working in jobs where um, working from home or hybrid models are not available. So those who benefited as a consequence of, you know, flexible working in COVID-19 were more likely to be in office jobs, higher than average pay, um, and as a consequence already had uh, some financial privileges. So yes, it could be positive for marginalised communities, but only if the infrastructure around it 
supported supported that. So, for example, it is about um, a better distribution and access to work that allows hybrid models for marginalised communities. Um, it's about um, access to data technology, because it's not simply just working from home. You are then also taking on the cost associated with working from home. There, it's not it, it's not cost free. So, you know, then we come to a question of are we talking about universal broadband? Are we looking at that as a utility? Do we need to think about access to Internet as essential? Uh, I'm using rhetorical questions, but it's pretty obvious where I stand. But um, the reality, of course, is that with the infrastructure needed to make it a positive move for marginalised communities does not yet exist. So it can be positive, but there are steps that need to happen before that to make it positive. And a lot of that is about um, data infrastructure and the distribution within the labour market. Thanks, Jeanette. I think that brings me to um, my next question. Is there a, do you believe that there's actually a will to see this time as a catalyst by key policy and decision makers to rebuild society differently and bravely in ways that address all these inequalities? Start with Susan this time. <laughs> so you're not a hard one there, Siobhan. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to be an optimist on this and say when you look at the narrative across the world, so if you look at the um, the World Economic Forum discussion, it, there's there's things there on um, the Great Reset and, and really looking at actually maybe we weren't living our lives in the, the way that was best for the planet or best for ourselves and, and maybe it was a kind of shock that we needed. However, I also think there's great forces in play that want us to return to exactly the same as normal before the pandemic. And I think you can see that in terms of what's being advertised at the moment. There's a real strong push on people to um, with the consumption message. Um, you go out, spend money, you know, you keep the economy going, all, all those things. However, actually, for climate change, you know, that's going to be a much bigger shock in the next 10 years. You know, we're already seeing communities across Scotland and the UK severely affected by the impacts of climate change and changing weather patterns. And, and we can't not talk about that. It has to be a, a massive thing, you know, for, for houses in Scotland that were already perhaps not as wind and water tight as others, you know, dampness is going to increase. You know, that's going to make fuel bills even higher than they are just because of um, the, the changes in gas prices. So, you know, if we know we're getting a wetter climate and we know that some of our buildings aren't wind and water tight, that's going to exacerbate all forms of poverty, you know, and I'm not into segregating different types of poverty to fuel poverty or food poverty. It's all poverty. It's all not enough resources um, to, to look after yourself or your family. And I think that's that's going to be really important. So as much as I want to be optimistic, Siobhan, there's a bit of me that says actually forces at play are pushing us to go back to exactly where we were. Thanks, Susan. Talat, did you want to come in on that question? <clears throat> Sure. So, yes, I, I think one of the things I'd like to focus on actually is the way in which participation and lived experience and communities engaging in policy making has been talked about a lot in COVID-19 and pre-COVID-19, uh, particularly in Scotland. We were already talking about what does participatory policy making look like uh, and deliberative democracy. So on one hand, uh, there there is an optimism there. Um, provided that gets given the resources and the importance and the the, the parity of a theme that's required between you know politician and public, and having making sure that there is more of the uh, participative decision making of more of the public in Scotland engaged, and I think there is a, a real effort in that direction which makes for better decisions um uh, uh, as we go forward over the next year and um, over the next decade in fact and we make COVID-19 recovery related decisions so I think there is some positivity there but yes I do have the same concerns as Susan so there's already um a, a very clear uh, push and um it's coming from places that are looking to increase profit to um uh embolden the economy where we're having uh, newspaper articles and reports released saying um, people need to get back into work people need to get back into the city center people need to get back into their offices and and of course we we've learned that that's not necessarily the case but it is about going back to a model of consumption going back to the previous model of um uh profit before people so if we are going to 
make any kind of real change and there's going to be real optimism, then we also have to have the ability to fight those forces that are looking at for us to get back to a normal that worked for a very small few. Thanks, Gillette. Dominic, did you want to comment on this? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think, well, the second part of the British Academy's review, which I'll show you here, um, recommended to seven strategic policy goals, and they're really about addressing exactly these kinds of issues. Um, but that, I'll just note the seventh of those goals, which is about building social purpose um, to drive the strategy for recovery for the economy and society. And, and the idea that you need these shared objectives that aren't just about making money, um, but uh, they do make money, they do make profit, because ultimately, if people are all working towards the same goals, they will support each other and invest their time and energy in doing that, and that, that generates an economy. Um, but, the, but the point is, yes, we have to take a look at the longer term objectives and a, a way of having a much more sustainable economy. Now, I think the problem is that politicians are, are largely aware of these problems and aware of this as an important perspective, but they're constantly attending to their short term need to be re-elected. And that is a real, a real difficulty. So it's really, really about the distribution of power, uh, which is an obstacle to, to making progress um, and the way that power is organized in our, in our political systems. So having actually much better and close, more closely connected structures of power, um, so the, the, the local, uh, the national, the regional, and the hyperlocal, getting those all best connected, communicating better, sharing information better, having more participation in power and democracy is one of the ways forward to address this whole problem. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we clearly have to, we, we can't just carry on in the same way. We, we can sort of manage the economy that way, but it won't work in the longer term. Uh, and this really does mean rethinking how we're going to do things. So, for example, we can't expect people who are living in a one bedroom flat um, to, to work from that position all the time as well. I mean, it's just not feasible. Uh, and we can't expect them to pay to heat it all day long in order to work. Better. So we're going to have to think about perhaps more locally available shared working spaces where all those services are provided, the desk space, the, you know, at the, 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 the social space as well, so that people can work without having to travel miles and miles to do so. Um, we've obviously got to do something about reducing the, the amount of uh, air travel that people do, but look at the, the paucity of investment in our in our public uh, transport systems, in the rail systems and the bus systems. You know, of course, people are going to carry on using cars, and buying buying battery driven cars is not the solution to the climate crisis. That just generates more costs in the end and more problems. So, you know, we really do have to rethink this, but it it requires a, a level of um, short term sacrifice from politicians, which I, I'm not wholly optimistic that we can achieve. And the pressure may just have to come from bottom up in the end. Thanks, um, Dominic, for that. We seem to have um, quite a few students from Indonesia, Indonesia today online with us in the audience. So a very warm welcome um, from Scotland. Um, Wilbert from Indonesia. I've got two questions here. What are the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on mental health? And we've got Sarah from Edinburgh. Does the report address concerns of the LGBTQ community about worsening me mental health as well? Um, I think, Dominic, could we start with you with that, those two questions? Yeah, I mean, I think unquestionably uh, all disadvantaged groups, it doesn't really matter which group it is, have suffered deeply through the pandemic. And there are you know, several ways in which they've suffered. One has been through isolation uh, and lack of access to services, uh, disconnection from the services that they need. Um, and, and I, I suppose you know, the, the deepening inequality affects those who are already most disadvantaged more strongly. Um, but I think the mental health impacts are, are quite difficult to calculate because they're going to be quite long term. I mean, if you just just take uh, 17, 18 year olds over the last two years, you know, they most of them left school without any um, properly uh, assessed final exams. They didn't have a leaving celebration. They went to university and were immediately locked up and not able to see anybody. Uh, you know, they've had totally isolated experiences in a way that was completely unprecedented and which is going to affect them for a long period of time. Um, children last year who went to private schools uh, had had pretty much continued education. They ended up getting better A-levels and exam results. 
and going to higher status universities than those who didn't. And those effects are going to last for the whole of their lives. So, you know, you look at these effects, they, they aren't just the immediate ones, they're the deeper, longer term ones. But mental health in particular, I think, is an area where um, it's not just about whether the services are there or, or the therapists or the rest, but it, it's about whether people are part of a social structure that supports them, whether they have you know, the ability to make friendships, whether they can find people to talk to, uh, all of those things, people who are, who are caring about them and thinking about them. And those things have been stripped away from many of those people. And that, again, takes a very long time to rebuild those kinds of, of networks and relationships. So I think the, the mental health implications are very serious. Um, and I think most disadvantaged groups and minority groups have suffered um, disproportionately through the pandemic. Thank you, Talat. Did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things that we um, have perhaps not given enough attention to, um, although you know, on the ground campaigning organisations and, and national services um, service led organisations have, we talk talking a lot about staying at home as the safe thing to do. But home is not safe for everybody. So for uh, women who are um, in a um, abusive relationship, experiencing domestic abuse. For um, LGBT young people, we've seen more of them unable to be their full authentic selves or feeling like they have to hide their sexualities because they are at home and at home has not been a safe, inclusive place where they can um, be out, for example. So whilst we have talked about stay safe, stay at home, that, that's not that's a contradiction for, for many people because home is not a safe place. As a consequence, that will have significant mental health impacts. Um, so it is it is important that we talk about services having good enough um, resources, uh, particularly, for example, women's aid centres or local uh, grassroots mental health services and supports LGBTQ community organisations to have long term um, resources and funding to be able to respond to what has been already a higher uptake of their services and will continue to be over the next few years. But there's also a, a wider issue of um, the, the system around people that allows them to access, regardless of whether we're in COVID-19, access spaces of support when home does not feel safe. And, and that's not just COVID-19 specific, that's, that was pre-COVID-19. Um, and as um, Professor Abrams has said, those who experienced um, inequalities pre-COVID-19 have suffered the worst in, during COVID-19. Um, so we were in a poverty and inequality crisis before we were in a public health crisis of this of this kind. And I think if we are going to do justice to what we've learned over COVID-19, we need to think of poverty and inequality as a pandemic in the same way we have COVID-19. That is the only way we will make the real changes to people's lives, the, the tangible difference to people's lives that are required for there to be any tackling of health inequalities, attainment and education gaps and inequalities, and income inequalities. Thanks, Gillette. Susan, I'll bring this on to you, but I just want to incorporate another question that's come in that does tie, tie in with this, and it's from Ronnie from Dumfries. And what do you think is long-term societal impacts of COVID-19 on younger folk, which, which lives have been affected by COVID, for example, because of the disruption to education, which I know um, Dominic mentioned earlier, but if you can just cover that as well. Thank you. And so I think it's going to be different for different people. I know this is the same answer that's coming through, but um, younger folk that have got resources and a safe place to live and a safe place to play have been affected very differently from those that haven't. And those that are able to access resources and and haven't had their, their education as disrupted as others that have got supportive parents, you know, they'll probably come out OK. Um, the, the other ones are are going to need much more help and, and much more support. And here I see a, a diverging narrative across the UK in that in Scotland, we do talk about poverty and equality. We do have, you know, binding um, child poverty um, targets. But in England, the narrative now is much more about social mobility. Um, but it, it's, it's really interesting because social mobility is not going to fix everything. It might fix some things for a few people that are able to get themselves out of poverty. But actually, it's, 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 not, the, it's not the be all and end all. And I think we really need to keep the, um, 
the term that's being used a lot in policy terms at the moment, a laser focus on poverty and, and keep working to, to do that. So back to Ronnie's question, um, the, the thing that I think connects with what Dominic has said is um, there was a trend um, in the UK that's very different to the rest of Western Europe in that we had far more um, young people leaving home to go to university than they did in other bits of, of Europe. Now, that came with a huge cost and huge debt. And for those with resources, you're much more able to manage that debt. And you probably have supportive parents that will help you with that. But it affects the rest of your life if you're leaving university with, you know, 40 grand's worth of debt and an additional 9% tax coming out of your salary each month once you hit that threshold. And I think we need to think about that because I know the young people in my team that might come out in the budget this week with a lower threshold for um, student debt repayments are scared. They're really, really scared. Now, that's not ones that are in university at the moment. That's ones that have left but have got this debt sitting on their shoulders and it will affect the choices for the rest of their life. And I think we've, we've, got, to, we've got to think about that. I think the, the kids that are in school at the moment, I've got two, you know, they're, they're kind of, um, they're hopefully going to have some resources thrown at them <laughs> to, to bring them through and out the other side. And we hope that mental health services will be there to support the ones that are struggling. But I think the, there are another generation, those early leavers of university, the ones entering work that we really, really need to worry about. Because if the university um, debt payment, student debt threshold goes down, you know, they're really, really scared about what's ahead. Thank you, Susan. We've got a question here from Flo from um, South Queens for Ferry, and I'll give this to Talat. Does a basic income provide the space for building a social infrastructure? Yes, pretty short answer, yes. So I think um, there are multiple interventions that are needed, but yes, um, a, a basic income standard is one way to tackle the anxiety, the concern, that so many people have of being able to pay bills at the end of the month and get food on the table. Being able to take that anxiety away creates an entirely different focus on life, an ability to be able to focus on health, an ability to be able to pursue work that you, uh, meaningful work that you will give you good mental health, um, allows you to pursue some of the social cohesion, community engagement work that we've been talking about. There are multiple interventions required a basic um, income is one very positive thing that we can and should do. Thank you, Talat. Dominic? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the basic platform of a decent society is that everybody should, should have enough to eat uh, and, and, and heat their home and, and uh, you know, live in, in adequate conditions. And we obviously don't have that at the moment here. And a lot needs to be done. I mean, I, mean, I, I think it is the case, Scotland's policies, um, if not its resources, are um, certainly more progressive than many of those in England, and it often sets a standard, I think, uh, which some of us feel quite envious of. Um, but it doesn't really get part of the big structural problems um, about the way that resources are distributed across society. And I, I, you know, I do think part of the problem is that we keep on trying to shift responsibility back to the individual to cope with everything that's thrown at them. And yet things, things like the changes in the the student loan system, um, you know, are, are not within an individual's control. Uh, just like the pandemic is not within an individual's control and trying to make individuals sort of responsible for tackling it is ludicrous. Um, you know, there has to be some level of responsibility from government to address the conditions which enable people to do things. Um, but, I, you know, I think pressure on mental health services in particular, but also physical health services, is made much worse by the fact that people are isolated that they don't have decent access to information, uh, that, that, you know, both technically they don't have the access, they don't have the, the computers or the internet access, but also they don't know how to use the information if they have it available to them. They don't know who to who to discuss it with. Um, you know, we've we sort of disabled people in a general way. We've made them incapable or, or, or unable to get the things they need, not because of their abilities, but because we've just created structures that make it incredibly difficult for them. I think rethinking what those structures are, finding ways to connect people up to one another much better and to provide that, that social mesh you know, is part of the way forward. And then actually also it becomes more apparent to those who have plenty of resources how unjust it is 
there are people who really have nothing and they they start to take responsibility not just for themselves but for others and <laughs> that's the real key here is feeling responsible for other people not just for ourselves Thanks, Dominic. Susan, I'm going to come to you with a basic income, but I've also got a question specifically um, for yourself from Sarah from Edinburgh. There seems to be a big, big focus or play on who what, people that want to go back to the status quo. Have you noticed if there has if there are industries or private companies, etc., that have decided not to go back to the status quo? So I'll come to that question second, if I can. I'll build on what Dominic's just said, which is there was a report out last year by the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries um, on the great risk transfer. And it's something that's happened over the last 20 to 30 years. And it's been slow, incremental change that's gone on and not, not everyone's noticed it. And I think that has meant that people have been much less resilient throughout the pandemic. So the pandemic. So it's it's been a, a slow movement of risk to the individual from state financial services and from employers. And that's meant that, that individuals haven't been equipped because it's gone on and they've not really noticed. They've not been equipped to manage that risk. And so we do need to talk a lot more about risk in our lives and help people to manage it where they haven't got the resources to do that. So I think that's quite an important point. And, and I know, um, I think it was Flo that's asked for the report links to be shared. So um, I can share that report link in a minute. Um, the, um, have I noticed positive changes? Yes. Now, in economic terms, I'm really proud of Scotland's history. I'm proud of New Atlantic. I'm proud of the Trustee Savings Bank and, and how it was started. And I think I see elements of that coming through now. You know, we've we've had a, a social enterprise movement in Scotland for, for many years, but we also have now a rising B Corps movement. So a number of companies that are firmly putting um, uh, things other things ahead of shareholder value and I think that's a really good positive one but the my, most high profile B Corp to convert recently has been Coots Bank and I think hearing them talk about it is is really interesting because I couldn't have imagined that happening maybe five years ago so that's a definite positive change that I think we we can be we can be pleased about. Thank you Susan we have a question from Leonard um, What's one thing you would say that further and higher education should focus of in should focus on in terms of recovery from COVID? We can bring you in, Dominic. Wow. <laughs> one thing. I, well, actually, I'll change the question if that's all right. I mean, I think what we what we need to do is realise that education is not something that stops and starts at school or university. Uh, and the Chancellor, I think, today announced a bit more money for supposedly lifelong learning but actually uh, you know what we're going to need to be able to do in the future is constantly adapt our skills and update our skills um, and, and knowledge to address new things that we need to do and that needs to go across the lifespan and I think there are two ways to address that one is to create a, an education system that can provide that education when it's needed for the people who need it at probably relatively cost free for them um, and the other thing I think is to build much stronger intergenerational uh, relationships and understanding, because I think um, we're very prone to to seeing generations as if they're completely separate things. But of course, older people and younger people are totally interdependent all the time. Uh, and it's in everybody's interest that both are receiving education and learning and support um, across their lives and actually doing it together. So that they develop mutual understanding as well and can then better support one another so i think there's a whole package of a sort of new way of looking at what we do with, with all of those spaces and i think also the arts and culture are probably quite integral to that because building that is also about getting people to have interests in things in common and that means having things they do together whether it be you know movies or theater or making music or or design or anything um so i think getting people it's really about connecting society up better as well, I think, to, to address that. Thank you. Susan? Yeah, I think, um, oh, it says I'm, I'm, I'm reading the unmute mute bits coming up on my screen, so just checking that I'm, I'm unmuted there. Um, I think for me, I've noticed um, a trend over the last few years of increasingly charities, when they were bidding to funders, having to bid for discrete funds for a specific type of group. And a lot of the types of places that Dominic's talking about where intergenerational groups come together or people with different backgrounds come together and, and join together on a common thing had gone. 
Um, and it meant that you were only really meeting people like you. And I know because I, I volunteered with the National Trust for Scotland for, for 10 years on, on projects all over across Scotland with a whole range of different people I would have never met in my professional life. And that completely changed me. But the reason I started doing it was because I didn't have enough enough money to pay for food at weekends. So I got free food while I was doing it. And that, you know, that drove me to do something that I loved. Also, that meeting loads of people and experiencing loads of things I wouldn't have done otherwise. And I think it's it's interesting how funders can drive different behaviours. So as soon as you stop funding and you, you want specific outcomes for specific groups, you can actually segregate society in a way that you maybe weren't meaning to. And I see that changing now, and it seems to be a tipping point, but much more about convening different people together. Thanks, Susan. Colette? Um, in, in terms of, of education, I mean, we've talked a lot about um, Scotland and um, the you know, progressive rhetoric and moves that it's made, but I, I do think we need to put a bit of a spotlight on something that Scotland hasn't done as well, which is um, when I first started working, um, uh, I was working in education and lifelong learning was the, 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 the phrase of the time. It was talked about, it was um, pursued, it was pushed, trying to get people back into education later in life. That does not exist in the same way in Scotland now. The focus has gone back to full time education. And as a consequence, what we've seen is a huge reduction in what colleges are providing. Um, we've seen a reduction in, in part time courses. We've seen a reduction in those from marginalised communities um, or second chance learners coming into education again. Um, and the uh, regionalisation process of colleges meant that uh, where we had uh, local access that was very community um, community level has become kind of city centre large colleges. Now I understand why that has happened, and there's been some positive impacts of that. But the negative consequences have been um, vocational courses, uh, opportunity to learn that is not. Here is a career trajectory. Here is the thing that you do for four years and then get a job. So what we see is education. We're, the point of access for education and the philosophy behind education needs to become less transactional. You come here, we give you, we give you information, you regurgitate it in an exam, we give you a qualification, you get a job. There is also education that is good for your health. Um, for your knowledge and your learning and your progress in life generally. There's one thing about the education philosophy, the access to education and its um, accessibility for marginalised communities and part-time learning that I think needs to be reinvested in in Scotland. The second is education that works for the future jobs that we will have. So we talk a lot about um, we need more people to be in tech, we need um, a, a just transition from oil and gas into renewables, but how realistic are we making that transition when everything really still depends on a four-year course and degree at university level? Is somebody who is in their 50s who's worked in oil and gas going to be pursuing that to get into a renewable um, renewable sector? Is somebody who is a single mum from Wester Hills who's never had access to education, never been prioritised, going to think, yes, first thing I want to do is go to a four-year degree at Edinburgh University in what will feel like a kind of hostile space um, and an elitist space? Is that person going to say, yes, that's, this is what I want to pursue to get me that job in tech and give me a secure future for myself and my children? So the way we do education, the philosophy of uh, behind education and why it exists needs to be less transactional, more flexible and better resourced. Thanks, Jeanette. Some really interesting and valid, valid points made there. Susan, I have a follow-up question um, from Sarah in Edinburgh. Um, is there any way that we can use the positive examples you have mentioned as a case to persuade those politicians, companies, etc., to not go back to the status quo? I think um, there seems to be lots of work going on on that, and I think I'm, I'm hopeful good things will come out of, of COP26. I can see a, a couple of comments in in the chat on that as well um you know there is talk that um is it cash coal and trees is that what the, there's a mantra that that they're talking about i heard Eledra stratton mentioning it the other day um i think the cash bit the finance bit 
um, I, I, I'm expecting, I'm hoping that there'll be an announcement out of COP26 that we'll see and encourage more businesses to, to lead the way and, and make changes. But I also think consumers have got a, a choice there about how they spend their money. And when, when we did research last year, people told us they were making conscious conscious choices then. Um, I don't know if they're still making the conscious choices now in the same way. I mean, we hear Amazon's profits are up um, and, and people are doing more on-demand spending, but then at the same time, they're wanting to save their own local high street. And, and you know, if you don't spend money in your high street, it won't be there. So it's that, that choice about we have money, how do we use it? But also, how do we encourage others that are maybe sitting on money in their bank accounts doing nothing, you know, with low interest rates? How can we encourage people to, to make more use of that in a positive way? And I think those are all really big questions. But some of, um, back to Sarah's point, is it's about telling the stories and it's about moving information around so that other people know that other people are doing it. Because as soon as everyone says, oh, it's not for me, I can't do that, then then I think people just carry on with the status quo. Thank you, Susan. Um, if, I think we're about coming closely to the end here, but I just wanted to, you to indulge your autocratic powers here. What are the immediate and longer term changes you would initiate to address inequalities if you were in charge of the nation or the world? Do we start with Dominic, please? The world. Uh, the world. Well, I think I, I would. <laughs> I will get this focus on on the sort of social purpose really uh, in place. I think a lot of employers, a lot of organisations, uh, a lot of individuals you know, really would like to see a much more humane world, humane planet. Um, and you know, the governments have a responsibility to set structures, incentive structures, tax structures, all of the rest. Um, to enable people to do that. So I think there, there is an appetite for it all, if only we can be brave enough to do it. Um, and I, I think the science and, and you know, our, our fantastic academic system in the UK um, is telling a very strong story about all of that. And if the politicians are willing to listen and follow the science uh, rather than just uh, notice it's happening, then um, we could make a lot of progress. Thanks, Dominic. Talet? Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm often um, ha having those uh, cups of coffee with people or a walk during COVID-19, which is what would we do if we could change the world to make ourselves feel better for 45 minutes before we go back to our desks? Um, but certainly when we're talking about that, what we're talking about is eradicating inequality and poverty. And the way to do that is to um, is wealth redistribution. We have to think about wealth redistribution in a way that makes sense for an economy that that is growing, but growing for who? So we need to move away from um, billionaire hold and stakeholder um, and shareholders who have um, power over those things that should be uh, in public ownership, that should be nationalised because they are um, used by everybody. So whether that is water and electricity, etc. And within that, the internet also needs to be included in that because none of us function in our lives without the internet now. We need to think about things that are necessary for us to live our lives and how those things need to be bought into public ownership. We need to think about wealth redistribution in our taxation system and um, so that more people have more of a share of the wealth that exists. Um, and in the immediate things that we're already talking about, like 4D working weeks without a loss of income, um, a basic minimum income, um, those are things that we can and should do, hopefully in the immediate future. And in the longer term, there needs to be um, genuine progressive taxation and wealth redistribution, not just here in the UK, it is a global issue. Thanks, Tillette. Susan, would you like to come in? Oh, I, I don't know where to start here. Um, I think if, if we're talking about Scotland rather than the whole world, um, I would double down on digital high speed broadband and digital connectivity and, and get that sorted as fast as we possible can. So if money's no object, let's do that. Um, we've, we've already got um, 30 megabits per second to 95 percent of the country, but we need that other 5 percent sorted. Um, so let's do that. We need to sort out nature-based solutions and, and biodiversity loss, because if we don't, we're scuppered going forward. Um, and I think the thing for me that we've probably not touched on in this, and um, we've touched on safe of communities and how some people can access green space and some not, but 
walkable communities have much higher levels of social cohesions and then all the other benefits that come about from that. So if we were to say one thing that would make communities in Scotland better across the board, um, taking into account that we've got some remote rural communities where it's not going to work for, but how people can get about more easily and potentially bump into people that they don't know and have conversations about the place in which they live, walkable communities have, have much higher benefits of people looking after each other and all those things that follow. So um, let's, let's do some more of that. Great, thanks very much. Um, I, we, I'm sorry, but we're not going to have to, uh, time for everybody's questions today, but I'd like to thank everyone for your contributions to the event. Before we close, I'd like to give each one of our panellists one minute to sum up the issues raised in the discussion. If I can start with Talat and then move to Susan and then finally end with Dominic. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation to be part of the panel. It's been great hearing from both Susan and Dominic as well. And thank you for your questions. Um, in, in if the, the summary is that we all have seen COVID-19 exacerbate poverty um, and inequality. The question is, what are we going to do about that? It's very clear, and governments have said it time and time again, right across the world, that um, poverty and inequality has been worsened. But at the same time, we've seen the UK government make a decision to remove the £20 per week universal credit uplift. So what needs to happen now is governments, not just with the rhetoric, but the interventions and the actions that we have learnt from COVID-19, and we see poverty and inequality as a crisis in the same way we saw this public health crisis of the last 18 months, and the same with the climate crisis. If we don't make genuine interventions that are as drastic as we've had during COVID-19, we will see both our planet and our communities um, fall apart as a consequence of poor decisions made too late. And I think we've seen too much of that during COVID-19. Thank you, Talia. Susan? Thanks, Siobhan. Yeah, and thanks to the Festival of Politics and, and the audience and everyone else. Um, I think we post-COVID world doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's tied up with the effects of Brexit. It's tied up with climate change and biodiversity loss and all of those things. I mean, we've got an incredible decade of change ahead of us, if not 20 or 30 years ahead. And, and that means the number one thing that we're all going to need to do is to listen to each other. And I think that skill, we've talked a lot about social cohesion. We've talked about really big issues of poverty, inequality, education, all these other things. But the key skill we're all going to need is to listen to people and listen to people that aren't like ourselves. And I think that if we can keep that front and centre of our minds, um, it will really help us in the next 10 years. Thanks, Susan. Professor Dominic Abrams. Thank you very much. So I'd echo this point. I mean, it's worth thinking something like this. If you had 171 people in a room who gave 1% of their wealth, you could take 5.6 million people out of the poverty that the £20 cut in universal credit is. Those 171 people are the billionaires on the Sunday Times rich list, and they'd still be billionaires at the end of it. Now, with that scale of inequality, then, you know, that raises the question, why aren't we doing something about it? And I think, you know, getting people to confront that degree of inequality and that degree of injustice, the unequal outcomes across the world, whether it be, um, you know, what's happening to, to the physical state of the planet or whether it be what's happening to, to levels of inequality or to, to health. Getting people to confront that and see it more clearly and to talk about it with each other, I think will help us address it all. And that's about sharing information and understanding one another better. Thank you very much, Professor Abrams. We must end there. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and making such a big contribution to the panel. The panel's brought into the partnership with the David Hume Institute. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to our panel, Susan Murray, Talat Yacoub, and Professor Dominic Abrams for giving up your time this morning. May I take this opportunity to remind you that later today we'll be discussing whether the global north is, a blame, is to blame for the climate emergency, the role of culture and art in wellbeing and health, and the plan to build resilient cities. And I do hope that you can join these discussions. Thank you very much.